I'm thrilled to be here, and I'm impressed with all the good things I hear about this church. I'm impressed with the man of God that leads it. Um, and I'm also excited about something that was on your website. When I heard Church for the Common Good, I kind of, my uh, executive assistant and I were like, what does that mean? <laughs> and so we went on the website, and I loved what it said. It's, it said, we believe God is calling the church to be good news far beyond the four walls of a building or any Sunday morning worship and into every crack and crevice of culture and society. I love that. So I decided I'm going to kind of use that as my inspiration today. So we're living in a time in our history where things have turned upside down when the issue of welcoming refugees is no longer a Jesus issue, but a political one. When we accept greed and xenophobia in our congregations, but refuse to practice the radical inclusiveness that Jesus practiced. We are living in a time when indeed, we need to take the church beyond the four walls of a building. John 1, 9 through 11 tells us that the true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. I often wonder if Jesus were to come into my life today in 2019, if Jesus was in our midst, would I recognize him? For the past 25 years, it's actually been 25 years, I'm 57, so I'm getting close to the end of my career, and I've worked with people who we call the poor, the marginalized, the least of these, orphans in Romania, children of lepers, AIDS patients, women and girls ravaged by the evil of sex trafficking in India. What strikes me time and time again is that Jesus does come into our world every day and we don't recognize him. In 2001, our family moved to India, four little kids under the age of six. And um, it's hard going to another country. And even though I grew up there till the age of seven, most of my family's here. So we didn't know a single soul. And shortly after we moved to India, 9-11 happened. And we watched with horror as the Twin Towers fell down. But the first people to come to our door with condolences were our Muslim friends. We found over the next few years that God had gone before us and prepared a community for us in Bangalore. It was there that we learned to live for him as a family. Through a series of circumstances, God brought this amazing group of six young men into our lives, all teenagers. They were without a home, and we allowed them to live in my husband's office at night. And in exchange for working for us and for the office, we put them all through college. It's not as expensive to go to college in India, and our exchange rate was really good those years. So um, each night, they ate dinner with us, and we started a Bible study that grew to include all their friends, our Muslim dry cleaner, and our Hindu security guard, who we later found out had been in prison, accused of killing his wife. And um, yeah, but I told my husband, I said, if we're gonna have a security guard, it's better a guy like that <laughs> than somebody else. So anyway, but it was, it was just such a fascinating time. And the first Christmas we spent there, it was, it was really lonely. We were separated from our family, the weather was hot and muggy, and we could only find artificial Christmas trees. And I went all over town trying to find a manger set with a brown baby Jesus. Now, with a million brown people in a country, you'd think I could find a brown baby Jesus, but they were all blonde hair, blue eyed. Um, and during those times, we were reading from Luke for our family devotions, and I stumbled on a verse that just blew me away. Luke 14, 12 to 14 says, then Jesus said to his host, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, don't, do not invite your friends, your brothers and sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they might invite you back and you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, 
Invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they they can't repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. So we discussed this, this scripture as a family, and as I said, our kids were between one and six. And I asked him, if we were, you know, Jesus' birthday is coming up here soon, and if we were going to celebrate his birthday and throw a party for him, who should we invite according to this verse? So they said, Mom, we should invite the lepers who come and beg at our, our door. And, and somebody else said, we should invite the rickshaw drivers that hang out and chew, um, chew the, the beetle leaves and spit it, you know. And when I'd go for walks in the morning, there was a lot of construction going on, and there were itinerant construction workers that their families lived in these blue tarp tents. And I would challenge the kids to running races And these kids didn't have school. I mean, the entire day they worked, and the girl children would watch the younger ones. So we invited them. I ordered food for 75 people, chicken curry and rice. And we made little flyers in different languages, because the boys all spoke different languages that lived, you know, the the young men that lived with us. Um, And we, we took it around. And then the kids took their Christmas money and they bought small toys, Hot Wheels and little Barbie dolls. So the day of the event, there was just like a little trickle of people. And uh, we did it in a church so they wouldn't think it was coming from us. But after, you know that scripture about when a beggar finds bread? After a while they went out and told people. And pretty soon there was a line out the door. And we were just busy serving food on banana leaves, you know, and the kids would go around and serve and give out the toys. And I would go around, most of the folks spoke my language, and I would talk to them. And what we found out, the funny thing is, that it wasn't just the first toy that the kids had ever had, but it was also the first toy the parents had ever seen. So they were, like the boys would be fighting their dads for a turn at Hot Wheels, (laughs) and the moms would take all the clothes on and off the, the dolls. Um, and braid hair, you know. But when I would go around and talk to them, they would ask me, why are you, you know, this rich woman from America, and you're married to a white man, you know? They said, why are you talking to us? We're, We're one of the untouchables. And I told them, I said, we're getting ready to celebrate, um, the birthday of our God, and when he was here on this earth, you were his favorites. You're the ones he hung out with. And some of them would just get tears in their eyes because they couldn't believe that a god, a deity, would be mindful of them, you know? At the end of the day, when we had, were exhausted, and people had, would get seconds and thirds of this food, you know, we weren't really paying attention. But when we counted the cups, the food that I had ordered for 75 people had fed 140. And we saw our own little Christmas miracle. You see, sometimes Jesus, he comes to us as a child covered in mud and living in a blue tarp tent. Will you take the good news of Jesus out of these walls to them? As I've taken on the leadership of World Relief this past year, I've been reminded that living for Christ isn't a joy ride where you can engage the cruise control. It's a minute-by-minute reliance on the one whom we have given control of our lives. I used to believe that living for Jesus meant following a set of rules. Don't drink, don't smoke, don't do drugs. There was a clear delineation in my mind between those who knew Jesus and those who didn't. My theology was very black and white with no room for gray. I used to think it was more important to be right than to live right. Jesus said something so powerful in Matthew 25, 35 to 40. He says, For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous answer him, Lord, when was it we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty, gave you something to drink? And when was it we saw you as a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it you were sick or in prison and we visited you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it 
to one of the least of these who are members of my family. You did it to me. Here, Jesus was not defining association with him according to what side of a social or political issue they were on. He defines his people as those who took care of him by taking care of those closest to his heart. I remember a Christmas when I was acutely reminded of this. My husband Tim and I, um, even before we were married, when we were just dating, started in attending an African-American church in Rainier Valley. We moved into the neighborhood almost 30 years ago, and shortly, um, we, shortly after that, we were asked to be the youth group leaders. Now, mind you, I'm a social scientist. My background, you know, I have a master's in marketing and international development. My husband is a lawyer, okay? We didn't know anything about youth ministry, but we were young, and, um, and they, didn't, they needed a youth leader. So we said yes. We were scared to death, but we said yes. Our entire youth group um, were African-American kids from the neighborhood, and many of them came from single-parent homes. Over the years, um, we had four kids in our youth group killed from gang violence or suicide, and many others who were shot. In fact, I was just um, three weeks ago in the hospital with one of our kids who just got shot. And um, one year, I remember that there were 12 young men of color killed in Rainier Valley due to a variety of reasons, but mainly gang violence. The kids in our youth group were devastated because they knew many of the kids that were killed, and one of the girls was dating one of the boys that was killed. So on my daily walks, I decided to walk up and down Martin Luther King and Rainier Ave South. And during these walks, I would just fight with Jesus for his peace in the neighborhood to be shed on everyone I passed. And I would fight with him and I'd ask him, why isn't there such a ruckus made when one of his sons of color were killed as when one child in the suburbs was hurt? And so these walks would go. And one day as I was praying, I heard a still small voice tell me to be silent. I was getting close to Christmas and, um, and as a youth leader, you're always thinking of ways to get kids engaged, right? How could we get these kids who are attracted to gangs to seek God instead? But on the walk, I heard the Spirit say something very clear. Get me out of the church. The people who need me are not only inside, but they, some of them may never enter your church. You need to go out to them. And then right then an idea just dropped into my heart. And I shared the idea with the church and with the youth. We decided to do a live nativity right outside the church on the sidewalks of Rainier Valley. And right next to our church, there was an abandoned parking lot. Um, we're like, our church is like down by Rainier Beach High School. So the youth built a manger and a cradle out of scrap wood with one of the um, guys in the church. We found costumes at Goodwill, and our preschoolers doubled as little angels. When Jesus was born, the angels came out and did a hip-hop dance. <laughs> we strung a huge star that we found at Goodwill, and we outfitted it with lights, and I told, so I was a drama major undergrad, okay? <laughs> so I have these visions in my head, and um, so I got one of the guys in the, in the church who was an engineer to rig it up on a pulley, and we, we uh, fastened it to two telephone poles in front of our church. So when the wise men and women followed the star, he would pull it and it would, it would go down the street. And um, finally for Mary and Joseph, I really had it in my head that they were gonna travel on a live donkey. But since there's not too many donkeys in the city, <laughs> I started to look for the next best thing, party horses. <laughs> I finally convinced a company out in the suburbs to give us a very reduced rate. I sold them on the vision of this whole thing. And they brought a beautiful little party horse from somewhere out in the boonies, Kenmore or something. I, don't, I still don't know where that is. They brought it into the city, and Mary and Joseph rode on this little party horse down the sidewalks of Rainier Valley with baby Jesus, who was played by a three-month-old baby in our congregation who was half Asian and half African American. We call, we call that a blasian in our church. <laughs> Um, 
The night of the performance, we ran the play four times with hot cider and donuts being served by some of our youth. There were quite a few almost crashes because people would just literally come to a screeching halt because they'd never seen anything like this. And some of the guys that we knew were dealing drugs. They walked down because they heard about it. And people who would have never come inside our church came and watched for a moment as peace and joy descended on the neighborhood. You see, our Jesus, sometimes he lives on the sidewalks of Rainier Valley. Will you take the good news of Jesus to him? Some of the incredible people I get to meet on a daily basis have lost their everything, everything for their faith, for their beliefs, or simply because of their ethnicity. They have been persecuted, seen their loved ones killed right in front of their eyes, and still they have survived. Last year, I had the privilege of attending the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, with a group of humanitarian aid workers and refugees to educate the attendees there about the global migration crisis. After that, I met somebody there. Um, we got to be great friends, and uh, I canceled my trip back to Seattle, and I went with this friend to Lesbos Island in Greece, where she worked inside the refugee camps. You know, there are 25.4 million of our fellow brothers and sisters living like this in a purgatory of not knowing if they will ever get out. A silent nation the size of Australia. And yet, less than 1% of them will ever be resettled in a new country where they can start a new life. In the middle of that camp, there's a square area enclosed by two barbed wire fences. In between those two fences are guards with machine guns. And as I was coming over um, a little hill, I heard just this loud din of voices and people just banging on these fences. Because inside the middle fence are the United Nations and European Union, Union officials that decide if a family will get to be resettled. The people that I spoke to called that their yes-no appointment. I realized that this was their only hope, getting out of this place, going to a country where they could be safe, where they could start a new life, where they could give their children a future. Because you see, the average time, the average time worldwide people spend inside a camp or in these protracted situations is 17 years. In one camp I visited, there were 1,500 beautiful children there. They're so precious. No school, not one book, one toy in sight. Um, they, just, they just hang around all day long because the parents are so busy trying to get that, you know, find some hope in that place. And these kids just run around like wild weeds. Some of the children had tied up some old clothes into a ball, and they'd found a basket without a bottom, and were taking turns throwing that ball into the basket. Ingenious. And when they saw me, and I had a UN badge on, and I was brown, you know, because they looked like most of them, they ran up to me, and they just surrounded me, and they said, you, Ind, Ind? And I said, Indian, yeah, me, Indian. And one of the little boys, they can't even communicate with themselves because they're from so many different countries, but somehow they find ways to communicate. But one of the little boys just, I didn't know this was the universal language, but he just started belting out a Bollywood song, okay? <laughs> and all the other kids joined in, and somehow I knew that song. And uh, so I just started doing my little dance, you know? And pretty soon all these kids were all dancing in the middle of that camp. And they even let me take a couple turns throwing that ball into the basket. But it just absolutely broke my heart because um, another one of my friends is a Harvard-trained child psychologist. And she is um, one of the few, there's, again, less than 1% have access to mental health care. Um, is she told me she's seeing kids three and under. She's treating them for rape. And what I didn't see outside that camp church where people holding up signs save our children like I see when I drive around in front of abortion clinics. There was nobody out there. You see, Jesus, 
He lives in that refugee camp, playing basketball with rolled up t-shirts. Will you take the good news of Jesus to him? Sorry. One of the women that I've had the privilege of meeting is a young mom named Asil. She's a Sunni Muslim, born in a majority Shia Muslim country. All her male relatives were taken away and killed. In fact, her brothers were killed in front of her. Her mom said, Asil, you're the oldest woman in our family and you've got to get married because we don't have protection. So they found her a man who was a good man. He got, they got married and soon three bouncing baby boys followed. One day the Shia militia came for the husband as well. And they beat him mercilessly and took him away. To this day, she doesn't know if he's alive or dead. Her neighbor said, you better get going because they'll come for you and the boys as well. And they hid her and the boys. And sure enough, the next morning they came, but the neighbors were kind enough to say, no, she fled in the middle of the night. So they moved from home to home, house to house, town to town. And finally, they saved up enough money, and um, they were able to get her a ticket with the boys to Turkey. In Turkey, she didn't know one soul. She didn't know the language. But somehow she managed, was able to register with the United Nations, and went through the long vetting process. It takes two years to be vetted. And while she was there, she also found out that she was pregnant, this time with a little girl that her husband had always wanted. So she finally got the papers that said, yes, you can be resettled. And they sent her to a place, a strange place called Seattle, Washington. Another place where she didn't know a soul. Well, World Relief had the privilege of welcoming her and her four little kids under the age of six. Can you imagine that plane trip? Um, any of you who are parents could imagine. <laughs> Um, welcomed her at the airport. We put something called a good neighbor team around her. That's a church that gets around a family and helps them do the work that we do in, in conjunction with us. So they helped her find housing. They helped her find uh, a ESL program. They helped enroll her children in school. I think it's the church at its best. Seven women in that church took one day a week to go visit a seal and give her a break. Um, I was able to get her her first official um, paycheck because she got a gig to speak at the Gates Foundation in front of 500 people, and she told her story in English. And I told them, you, you know, she needs babysitting and she's taking her time and her time is valuable, so you better pay her. So her first paycheck is from the Gates Foundation. How many of us can say that? She um, just got her first job in a laboratory because she's a microbiologist by training. You see, our Jesus, sometimes he wears a hijab and is tired from a lifetime of loss. Will you take the good news of Jesus? To her? I won't lie to you, these last two years have been some of the most difficult of my life, but they've also been the most joyous. We've had a 74% drop in the number of refugees entering our country. 74% drop under this administration. Under President Reagan, we had 200,000 refugees coming into the country a year. Under President Bush, even after 9-11, we reached 70,000. This last year, we welcomed 20,000. And these are the most vulnerable of the vulnerable. If you look at how the UN um, determines who gets to be resettled, it's they triage the most vulnerable, the people who are um, sick, elderly folks, children, single moms. And that's who we're saying no to as a nation. Um, following Jesus will often break your heart. I've seen it the last two years. 
but you'll also see miracles on a daily basis. Following Jesus will test your capacity for love, for resilience, for mercy. He will challenge you every day to see him in each person you encounter and to love them well. Following after him, you will cease to draw lines. You will stop asking, are they in, are they out? Because our Jesus is radically inclusive, he is radically gracious, and he is radically loving. Church, let's take the good news out of these four walls. The good news needs to go out to those who may never enter. And I'm going to end with a video that will show you how World Relief is doing just that. And afterwards, if you'd like to know about ways that you can volunteer with us, um, Brooke, one of our interns from SPU, is here, and she'll be outside at, at the um, table, or you can talk to me. There's so many ways. I know this is a talented church, so I want you to come work with us, all right? Thank you so much for your time. <laughs>